how one of the Thunder's biggest advantages in the playoffs showed up against Toronto on today's Locked on Thunder podcast. You are Locked on Thunder, your daily Oklahoma City Thunder podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it going on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host, media member, and Inside the Thunder beat writer, Ryland Styles. Follow me on Twitter at Ryland underscore Styles. Follow the show on Twitter at LO Thunder Pod. Email the show, LO Thunder Pod at gmail.com. On today's show, brought to you by Prize Picks. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked in NBA to use your code uh, and uh, type in all lowercase locked in NBA for the first deposit match up to $100. We're talking about how the Thunder had a massive uh, advantage for them in the postseason show up in this win against Toronto. Jalen Williams was huge. The bench was huge. And the Thunder turned the tides and won this game in Toronto to start this road swing. Again, thank you so much. Make this your first listen. Subscribe across all podcasting platforms. So when you look at this Thunder team, they've done a lot already to, you know, boost themselves up and to try to prove themselves heading into the postseason. And at this point, you're either in or you're out on the Thunder. Like there's nothing more within the bounds of an 82 game regular season that they can show you. This is who they are. This is who they've been the entire season. A top five offense, top five defense, top five net rating, an elite shooting team, a top defensive team whenever they really dig in there with these elite athletes who can switch everything, play the passing lanes, force turnovers, and they can really conform to a lot of different styles of play. The Thunder really only have two things that you can you know, really pick apart. Inexperience and a lack of size against certain matchups. Again, certain matchups, not every matchup. So even the second uh, point is already a little bit faulty and the Thunder have a way to make their lack of size into at worst a um, kind of offsetting situation. And at best, turn it into an advantage by turning you over, by getting you in fast break situations and so on and so forth. So those are things that we've kind of hammered out about this Thunder team. And you're either going to take it at face value of what we've seen this whole year, or you're going to continue to you know, play this side of until some team does it, you're not going to crown that team. But this Thunder team has shown you throughout the year they're one of the best the best in the NBA. They're one of the, the top teams in the West, and they currently sit in first place with an MVP, with a couple rising stars. And in this game against Toronto, they showed one of their biggest advantages in the postseason. So I know that that sounds funny because – how could you possibly have done that against Toronto? Toronto not only is not having a great season this year overall, but in this game, they're without Gary Trent Jr. They're without, you know, RJ Barrett, Emmanuel Quickly, Scotty Barnes. Like they're without even some of their better players on a, on a roster that was not uh, built to compete. But the way that the Thunder were able to show, you know, just how good they can be in the postseason is the fact that they have this element of stepping up for each other and this knack to to allow you know some of their top guys to have poor nights and, and when i say poor nights of course that's the context of their standard not the context of just an nba game or a basketball game in general but it was clear that sga did not have his normal stuff this is yet another game against the raptors where he doesn't score 30 points uh while it's interesting you also have to remember they only play the Raptors twice a year, um, and, and so it's it's more difficult uh, to do it against Eastern Conference teams. Nonetheless, though, SGA puts up 23 points on 45% shooting, one for five from three, four for six from the line. We went nine for 20 in this game. Um, I, I think that whenever you look at this game from SGA, the Raptors did everything that they could to sell out and to stop him. I mean, collapsing on him at the elbow and forcing the ball out of his hands as much as possible. It went and created a lot of turnovers. Like, you know, this is another uncharacteristic part of, of his game tonight from SGA was the six turnovers. Rarely has he turned the ball over at a high clip. And this Thunder team as a whole, you know, part of that was the Thunder team also turned it over, uh, you know, 15 times, which is not characteristic for them either. 
But clearly SGA did not have his best showing and his, and his best fastball. And when you look at other teams across the league, if their superstar player plays subpar, it's really tough to win against anyone. You know, the 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 way that you see this Thunder team step up and be able to counter if Shea's not hitting or if j not hitting or gets hurt against Memphis or if Chet Holmgren doesn't have it or whenever their bench isn't scoring or vice versa, their starters can't score. Like, they're able to complement each other so well that you go from this awkward first quarter where the Thunder did not play their best defense the offense also wasn't exactly clicking to a second quarter that featured a 21 to 4 run to take control of this game. And it was led by Jalen Williams and it was led by this bench unit. You know, and, and bench unit, of course, being the staggered lineups of of putting Chet and Dub uh, and Josh at times uh, with the bench unit to allow them to take off and never look back. You know, the Raptors. Uh, grew an 11 point lead in that first quarter. And in the blink of an eye, you go from, you know, down 11 to whittling it down to six to a 21 to four run up by 22 at the peak. And only one lead change was all that was necessary in this game. So the Thunder have done it in a lot of ways. They've done it whenever they click on all cylinders, they've done it whenever they click early you know, stall out in the middle and then finish strong. They've done it whenever they start slow and then get it going. They've done it where against Minnesota in Minnesota, where they just played an ugly, you know, brand of basketball. Both teams did. They got into the mud and found a way to survive in advance. Like they, they can win games in a multitude of ways. They can, they can make up for the lack of production from anybody on the roster. And when you have those ingredients and intangibles, that's what becomes necessary in the postseason. When you're when you're taking things in seven game chunks, how can you piece together four wins out of seven games? You piece it together in a multitude of ways by having your stars play like absolute unbelievable superstars one night, by having your role players just not being able to you know miss and just seeing the the incredible large rim and, and shooting threes at a high clip and everything else. You win games by by gutting them out and getting a break down the stretch. And you win games by by guys stepping up in, in, in place of others maybe having uh you know a, a poor night. And this Thunder team was able to rely on Jalen Williams, who had 20 points in this one, and really did it all. He lived below the rim 20 points on zero three point attempts in this game. He was operating as a short role playmaker. He was able to uh, cut back door. He was able to run in transition. He was able to do everything. And of course, driving it to his spots as well. He just did everything offensively to shoulder the load for this center team. Lou Dort had 10 points. Chet Holmgren had 18 points. Josh Giddy had 10 points. And so you were able to recreate some of that scoring punch by Kenrich off the bench, having his best game in a long time. 12 points from him. Case and Wallace having 12 points of his own right. So you can recreate whatever form of, form of drop-off that there is. And the most important part is, while we talk about this whole lean-on-me situation of leaning on uh, your complimentary pieces to your MVP, your MVP is like bad games, like the games where you're like, oh, Shay, Shay just didn't have it tonight. Go back and check the stats and the, and the box scores of all the games where you felt like he didn't have it. His floor, his version of not having it, is still 23 points, seven rebounds, four assists, eight assists, I should say, uh, three steals, a block, and shooting 45% from the floor. And if one more of those shots go down of the 20, he's shooting 50%. So when that's your floor, when that's your like, hey, SG is going to do no worse than 20 efficient points, a high-level defensive impact, dishing the ball around and kicking it out, making the right reads whenever you put pressure on them. If that's going to be the floor of what your star can do, this Thunder team has the players who can step up, has the players you can lean on. Because if you're going to do everything in your power, which Toronto did to their credit, if you're going to do everything in your power to box up Shea, 
you're going to be leaving creases for J Dub, for Chet to exploit you. You're going to be leaving lanes for Aaron Wiggins to take advantage of that, of them pushing the pace off, off of a make, getting the ball out of the basket, going 94 feet in the blink of an eye for a dunk. Like when your sole focus is on SGA, it opens things up for their players. And the Thunder have other players around their star who can make you pay for that. And if you don't put all your focus on SGA, he'll make you pay as well. So that's how against Toronto, the Thunder were able to show you just how good they can be in the postseason and just how dangerous they'll be in the playoffs. It's tough to guard them. It's tough to choose who to, who to take away. You look at it like the Patriots used to take away your best weapon. Who's your best weapon in the sense of if you're taking them away, if you're taking Shea away, who is your best weapon? You still have to deal with J-Dub, have to deal with Chet, have to deal with the fact that Isaiah Joe, who didn't shoot well tonight, could have easily hit a couple more threes and really broke this game open earlier. And the Thunder once again played a game where, yeah, it was tight at the beginning with a team who it should not have been tight with. But that was a pretty fraudulent, um, um, competitive first half from Toronto. The thing, that they did, the thing that they did really well is they defended Shea really well in the sense of defending him well in the sense of forcing him to get the ball out of his hands. And they got hot from three. And the Thunder were not hot from three. If the Thunder have a more normal shooting night and cut down turnovers, this game would have been a, a blowout from start to finish. It ended up being a blowout uh, in the end anyway because you're not going to ever play a 48-minute perfect game. But this week has been encouraging for the Thunder, of course, getting a couple wins and these gimme wins that you need. And now, here comes the real push at the end. Here comes the push that can define SGA's MVP season. Here comes the push that can decide what seed you finish with and will decide what seed you finish with in the Western Conference and more. We'll talk about that. Plus, I think that the Thunder did a wonderful job on Wednesday with Kendrick Williams that set him up for success in this game and why that's so important for the postseason. We'll talk about all that coming up. But first, I want to tell you right now about our good friends over at Prize Picks. Check out Prize Picks right now. It's the best way to play daily fantasy sports. You're going to want to go there right now because what it is is it's just you versus the projected numbers. So you pick two to six players and you just predict will they have more or less than their prize pick projections. And right now at Prize Picks, you can even get on demon time at prize picks because with the, with the demon and goblins game, you can take like 10 bucks and turn it into a thousand with these special squares that are marked with red demons or green goblins to get you different payouts. Uh, so go there right now. You can simply just bet on like, uh, or predict on Shea more than, you know, three and a half rebounds, for example, Chet more than one and a half blocks you, know, you can do stuff like that which is really fun to allow you to watch the game have some uh you know more excitement on the line as well so go to prizepicks.com right now and when you do use code all lowercase locked on nba use code locked on nba for that first deposit match up to a hundred dollars that first deposit match up to a hundred dollars with code locked on nba at prizepicks.com slash locked on nba We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much for making us your first listen every single morning, every single day. We're here for you talking Thunder basketball. What a time this was for the Thunder to get this win against Toronto. I think that what they did on Wednesday directly allowed them to flip the switch in this game, and that was resting Kenrich Williams. You know, Kenrich Williams didn't play Wednesday, and that, that allowed him to, in exchange for one game, and no offense to Kendrick Williams, but like if you were to lose to Utah on Wednesday, with all that Utah was missing, with the goal in mind that we've seen Utah have down the stretch of this season, if you were to lose to Utah on Wednesday, it would not have been because you didn't play Kendrick Williams. Now, luckily for the Thunder, they took care of business and really broke things open in the second half. You were able to exchange that one game played for Kenrich Williams. In turn, you get five days off for him. So you get five off days in exchange for one game. And that directly you know, led to, in my opinion, him looking more spry, him looking more uh, you know, physical and uh, being able to move better in this game, more mobility defensively running the floor better in transition, 
It, it looked like he was just healthier. And I think that um, while it is a funny a joke to call him the old guy of the team because he, he's only 28, he's not old in the sense of age or even you know in the sense of NBA experience, you know, six years or whatever. Like, yes, he's a veteran, but he's not like just ancient. However, that's a very taxing style of play. You know, the hustling, diving on the floor, being the enforcer, playing physically on both ends of the court every single night. That is very taxing on the tires. That is very much something that, um, you know, can beat you up quicker. You can be an old 28. There, there is such a thing as an old 28. We talked about this a lot with Steven Adams whenever the, whenever he was on the Thunder. Like, you know, they might not be old in, in age-wise, but they're old in, you know, their, their tread on the, t- on the tire. And with Kendrick Williams, you get five days off, you get him rejuvenated, and he looks really well. And he played really well in this game. And he he made some plays that really flipped things, a couple putbacks uh, that really sparked the thunder. Hit a three as well. And when you look at Kenneth Williams, if that's what you're going to have to do, we talk about load management uh, with, with superstars, but if you got to load manage, you know, your enforcer, so to say, guess what happens in the playoffs? Because you've played so well this season, the Thunder have ensured themselves that they're going to be a top six seed. And while everyone debates one, two, three seed, whatever it is, being a top six seed, no matter where you finish, one through six, you've got a full week off ahead of game one. And that full week off can do wonders for a guy like Kenrich Williams. And if you have a fresh Kenrich Williams who can play like this in game one of a playoff series, at home, raucous environment, it really does change things, and you're you're one fourth of the way there to a series win. And so with Kendrick Williams, you know he goes out there with twelve points, gets you five rebounds, a couple assists, four steals. Like he was awesome. He flew all over the court, two for three from three, five for seven from the floor. I think that one of my uh, favorite. You know, plays that happened in this game, there, there was two, one from Jada, a sequence from Jada, and then this play right here, where Isaiah Joe sets his typical guard to guard screen with SGA. So, so he sets the screen for SGA. SGA drives off of it, uh, you know, around the nail area, and then kicks to Isaiah Joe, which is always a good decision. But SGA, SGA kicks to Isaiah Joe, and Isaiah Joe, you know, swings it over to Kenneth Williams. So whenever SGA initially kicks it to Isaiah Joe, obviously the defense is going to go rotate over to him, try to close out hard on him. Kenneth Williams is sitting in the corner, so it goes from SGA at the nail to Joe at the slot to Kenneth Williams at the corner. Wide open corner three, Kenneth Williams hits it. He's been hitting the ball. Uh, you know, he's, been, he's been shooting the ball well from beyond the arc this season, uh, and it continued tonight uh, for him, two for three from three. So I think that with Kenneth Williams, it seems very – uh, likely that what helped him in this game was rest and these five days off for him. And it's very encouraging that in the postseason, you're going to get five days off leading into your first game. And the structure of series oftentimes is, you know, play a game two off, play a game three off, you know, play a game two off, and so on and so forth. So you're going to have a little bit more time to recover especially in the first round where you're trying to fit in so many different series um, from the NBA side of things. So that can really help the Thunder and, and be a difference come playoff time is the additional rest for Kenneth Williams. And another guy who's, who's so far this year, no surprise, has benefited from you know additional days off has been Chet Holmgren, who played well in this game. 18 points, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 18 points, 10 rebounds in this game. An assist, two steals, and a block. Two for four from three, 61% from the from the floor in 36 minutes. I, I think that whenever you look at Gordon Hayward, too, that we're going to talk about your takeaways coming up, but like Gordon Hayward, five points, six boards, an assist. He is playing his role really well. And some of the things he's doing is not going to show up in the in the one for three from three. You've got to actually just zero in on Gordon Hayward. Like whenever he plays, you know, next, you know, watch him and see how the defense is treating him versus other players. Even as he goes one for three, just that 
little bit of extra space you gain from a guy staying more attached to Gordon Hayward's hip than other players is a direct benefit for this Thunder offense. And he's not going to score 30 a night. He's not going to score 20. But I think that we've seen, as he's gotten more comfortable, he's gotten better. I think that he played well in this game. He's got the defense part of it down as a team defender. And he's helping on the on the glass. I don't think there's any surprise that, you know, since the Thunder have acquired Gordon Hayward, they've gotten a lot better, of course, post-All-Star break when we started playing at defensive rebounding. That, that has gone to the middle of the pack. And you treat Gordon Hayward as what he is. is a, he's a complimentary player for this rotation. And the Thunder still made a great move at the deadline doing that, doing so, getting a complimentary player for the rotation. Because at best, that's what those other guys would be. You'd be hoping that they could get there. Gordon Hayward, he's on his way back from this calf you know, injury and rounding back in the form, he's already there. And you, and you kind of trust him more than you would trust a, a Michich, than you would trust a, a Trey Mann. Like you trust him more in these in these games. So I think that Gordon Hayward played well. I think that uh, Aaron Wiggins played well in his 12 minutes. I just would really like to see Wiggins' minutes get closer to 20 than 15, and in this case, 12. A lot of the nights he plays 12. Now, that being said, I wonder how much of that, of Wiggins' playing time, which is a huge um, you know, talking point. I wonder how much of that is the Thunder know what he is. I'm a huge Wiggins guy. I believe he's a massively helpful player to winning basketball. But he's not going to turn into a different player with more minutes. Like, this is who he is. Multi-year college guy. Consistent NBA, you know, contributor. This is who he is. And you know already, you have enough data from his whole NBA career so far. He will just fit. With any lineup, at any position, he'll get it done. So when you're talking about exploring and testing things, there's not much to test with Aaron Wiggins. He's passed all the tests. He's even passed the test of like, if you need him as a swing starter, he can do that as well. So I, I'm, I'm going to be curious about what happens come playoff time. Because in my view, Wiggins should be playing much closer to 20 minutes a game in the playoffs than, than 12 or 15. So let's see if he gets there. Because I have to believe that like that's part of the decision of playing him less is you've got enough of a sample size of who he is. Like, you know who he is. You know who Kinnerch is. You know who these guys are. But if you can get Casey Wallace 23 minutes and he's hanging in there even in, in the garbage time, because as we talked about before with Casey Wallace, he's been so good that you haven't gotten to um, – you know, send him to the blue where he's able to just go play a different role, go play a more on ball oriented, uh, you know, free for all type of role, not free for all in the negative sense, but free for all in the sense of he's not just some catch and shoot defending robot. Um, not that he plays that way right now, but just saying in garbage time, he's able to spread his wings a bit more than he is during the course of a tight game as a role player. Whereas with Wiggins, you could have left him in the game. And, and you could have played him a ton um, in garbage time. But what does that really gain? I, I don't think that there's another step for him. So as he gets three minutes in garbage time, you know, in, in the fourth quarter total, the number could have easily risen to Kaysen's nine. You keep him and Kaysen on the floor together in garbage time, then his minutes per game kind of looks different. You know, at least in this game looks different. So long way to say, I think in the playoffs you have to play Wiggins more. And I have to hold out hope that they will. But, you know, I've, I've been no stranger to, to being wrong. Coming up, let's talk about your takeaways from this game. But first, I want to say right now, my good friends over at eBay Motors. Check out eBay Motors right now. When you do, 
you're going to find that they can keep your car at MVP level. Passion, drive, and patience. What makes winning plays and brings home trophies is the key. It's also the key in keeping your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performances. From superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more, whether you're into speed or power or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts to choose from, your number one ride or die, you'll always find the exact thing you're looking for with eBay's guaranteed fit, and your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're going to be burning rubber, not cash. So go there right now with all the parts you can need at the prices you want. It's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win by keeping your ride or die alive at eBay Motors. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply at eBay Motors. eBay Motors guaranteed fit only available for U.S. customers. We're back on the Lockdown Thunder Podcast, on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Folks, the Thunder got this win over Toronto, and it was a you know awkward start, but they were able to blow it out in the end. The Thunder win the rebounding battle by 10 rebounds. However, uh, the turnover battle was interesting to me. The Thunder, while well, we're sitting here talking about how uncharacteristic it was to have 15 turnovers, they forced 27 turnovers in this game. The Raptors were throwing the ball left, right, and center anywhere but to their teammates' hands at times in this game. The Thunder shot 50, 37, 78. The Raptors shot 52, 36, 70. The Thunder won points in the paint. They won second chance points, and they won fast break points. Once they settled in, they dominated this game in every way possible. And I think that it was another showing of like just how good this team is. Like If you take a first quarter to settle in against a bad team, that's just so typical of what happens around the NBA. And they were able to blow this team out even without SGA like having a having a otherworldly game. So we'll talk about your takeaways from this game. Uh, ben Glover says, this team has arrived and uh, it was a bad Shea game, but still able to win by 20. Yeah, I mean, this Thunder team, I don't know what can possibly be holding you back from this Thunder team. Like, sure. You know, part of... Um, you know, sports and the fun of it as we watch March Madness right now, which has not been great. Not a ton of madness so far in March Madness. But as we watch March Madness right now, part of the fun of sports is the unpredictability of it and the fact that, sure, the Mavericks or the Lakers or the Warriors or the Kings or whomever could theoretically beat any team you know, with it that they play up against until the, the, until the series is over. But you should not have any increased pause with the Thunder than you did about any other, you know, first place team. The Thunder have two weaknesses, one of which they've really rectified to the point of they're a middle of the pack rebounding team since all-star break, a uh, defensive rebounding team since all-star break. And if that's like your weakness, your flaws, your middle of the pack, but you're elite at a billion other things, then you're a really good basketball team. I don't care how old you are. You know, I really don't. And they've ha- and they have guys who at various stops in their careers, whether it be, you know, FIBA, whether it be college, whether it be the NBA itself with Dort and Shea, they have guys who have proven to be gamers and and rise to the occasion of playing in big moments and embracing big moments. So I don't see what what's holding you back because there's always a threat that the one seed could lose. That Mavericks team that lost to the We Believe Warriors was incredible. It was awesome to watch them for 82 games. They lost. The Bucks last year. Like You were not sitting here fretting about a Milwaukee losing in the first round last year. You were not sitting in Dallas taking on the We Believe Warriors, scared to death at this time that they'd get ousted in the first round. Like, it can happen. It has happened before. But I'd pick the Thunder against almost anybody. And 
I'd feel good about the Thunder against anybody not named Denver. And of course, we've talked at nauseum about the Lakers being a bad a bad matchup. But even their bad matchup, I think, yeah, it's gonna be really tough. You still win. You know, in seven. So they've arrived and they're really good. And it's gonna be fun to see how things un- unfold. I think that they're honestly, and I hate to do this because I, I hate for it to sound like uh you know, flyover state insecurity. But honestly, what I think it is, is that you get on a national scale, you get these talking points about teams because it's impossible unless you truly love it. And you truly are just a sicko who like in the daytime, you watch the games you missed. And at night you watch as much as you can. And you've seen every game and you've studied everything and spoiler alert. There's not very many at the, at the national level who do that. They're just not. And there's not many people in general who can do that. It takes a unique set of circumstances for you to be able to do that. And so when the Thunder are on national television and they're playing, you know, their 82 game schedule and they're going along and they're not playing these marquee, you know, teams, then you just stick with your talking points that, that you've that you've found out about. Like uh, they can't rebound and they, and they don't have age, they don't have experience. And you never change or pivot or 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 adjust or even watch the team to know that one of those two flaws is often an advantage for them, right? So I, I, I think that part of the skepticism of the Thunder is just a sheer ignorance of not watching them play. And the Thunder, to their credit, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, to the point of this conversation, the Thunder will be put in front of a national audience soon. And I'm not even talking about the playoffs, but like, even though these games aren't like nationally televised, you're going to tune into the Milwaukee game, you know, both times, Boston, Philadelphia, like these are the teams that people watch and they're going to get eyeballs. They're going to be able to, to become the talk of the town. They've already changed that narrative a little bit here in the last couple of weeks. Zach Lowe was very complimentary of them. Uh, JJ Redick and Tim Legler, very complimentary of them. So it's starting to change for, for the better for OKC. The mismatch also uh, had a good thunder pot, I believe. Um, like it's going to change for the better for them. But like, to me, you look at the Thunder team and I just don't know what you're holding out for or what you're waiting on to see to force you to believe in them as a traditional one seed. Like this team is legit good enough. They're good enough. They've beaten Denver in the season series, which is, isn't going to one-to-one translate to the playoffs, but they're also not going to get just curb stomped in the playoffs should they be fortunate enough to go all the way to the conference finals. And both teams make it there. At the end of the day, I don't think you can have a rational opinion that says anything other than at the lowest on the Thunder that the Thunder are going to be a a six or seven game out. Like that's the lowest you can possibly be on the Thunder is that, yeah, they're good in the regular season, but they'll lose in seven. Okay, well, if you believe that the series can go to seven in a star-driven league and you have the MVP of the league, you can win any series. And that's the case for every team that's that's a contender. Of like, if you, as long as you can win any game, then yeah, you're a contender. Boston's a contender. Denver's a contender. So it's easier to be a skepticist because you're oftentimes going to be proven right. Like, it's so easy to be negative. And, th- and that's where a lot of young people, uh, and, and which is what a lot of social media is, uh, fall into of like, they're young and they think that the only way to be objective and the only way to be, um, you know, kind of non-biased is to be, Negative, because oftentimes you're going to be right. Only one of 30 teams wins a championship, right? Only one player wins MVP. Only only a handful of guys in the history of the league has overwhelmingly more good games than bad games in the regular season. So like at every level, it's easier to be negative than not, but that's not true objectivity. True objectivity is just saying what's happening, good, bad, or indifferent. And right now, everything that's happened so far for the Thunder has been good. We can talk about Josh Kitty, which we have a lot in the show. We can talk about the rebounding. We can, t- we can talk about the inexperience. But go listen to Lockdown Celtics. Go listen to Lockdown Pelicans. Go listen to Lockdown Mavericks. Go listen to uh, any Lockdown show across the NBA. They're going to have things that they love about their team and hate about their team, and and they're watching it the most intimately of anybody, and that's why this network is so cool. But like that's just normal. That's par for the course. So the Thunder have arrived, and there's no... Um, reason to be hesitant to say it. They, they've arrived. 
They're going to be one of the best teams in the NBA for quite some time. And this year could be a year where they go on a deep playoff run. Obviously, it's going to depend on the matchup and the bracket and yada, yada, yada. But it'll be really fun. And you should stick around uh, to Locked on Thunder anywhere. You get your podcast from, including on YouTube, so you never miss an episode. And until then, be good and be good to one another.